So uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name's Katie, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Staff Pride Network here at Edinburgh University. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to our event this evening, um, starting with the boring health and safety bits. Um, so there's no fire drills planned, so if we do have an alarm go off, please exit the building by the entrance through which you came um, and congregate out into the courtyard there. Um, if you need the toilet, there are two gender neutral toilets on this floor, straight down the corridor um, from this door here, um, as, as well as an accessible toilet, and there are gender toilets upstairs and downstairs as well. Um, this evening is going to be recorded, um, but only those with a microphone will be captured on the audio, um, and only those sitting in this area here will actually be captured on film. Um, we're going to have the opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of the panel discussion. Um, and you can do this th in two ways. So there are pen and paper at the front here, and there's also an online option. Um, we're going to give you time to think about your questions throughout the panel discussion, and there'll be a short break where you can um, submit your pen and paper options at the front here. Um, and then the chairs will um, select questions from the various resources. Um, you'll have seen on your desks and also received via email our safe space policy. So today we welcome all those who self-identify as part of the LGBT communities, regardless of identity or background, and provide a space where all can be, feel safe and included. We don't support or tolerate anti-LGBT violence, harassment, or hate speech, and encourage an inclusive and, and respectful language. As a positive space for listening, we promote the dignity and well-being of all network members um, here at the university. This event is being covered by the Students Association Safe Space Policy, which can be found via the link, which you were all sent by email as well. Um, and breaches of the policy may result in any individual ask, being asked to leave the event, but we don't expect that to be a problem. So a few thank yous, first of all. So Tracy, our wonderful um, Staff Pride Network volunteer, has put in a huge amount of effort in planning and organizing this event. Um, and it would be impossible for us to do this without the great network of volunteers that we have. So thank you, Tracy. Um, <laughs> She and I will be on hand um, to support the chairs throughout the panel if you have any technical problems, and Robbie as well, who's been really brilliant um, putting together the slides that we have today and supporting us with um, all the technical stuff. So thank you, Robbie. Um, I want to thank Vicky Bell from the communications and marketing team. Unfortunately, she couldn't be with us here tonight, but she has produced the film that you're about to see that um, we've made about staff experiences under Section 28. Um, I want to acknowledge my fellow co-chair Jonathan McBride who's been entirely instrumental in planning um, and implementing this event. Um, he painstakingly transcribed the video so that we have subtitles um, and he's sadly unable to join us tonight because he's having knee surgery um, and part of the reason why we're recording it is because he's getting serious FOMO that he's not here. Um, uh, I want to thank our wonderful chairs who will properly introduce themselves. So Sharon and Elliot, uh, thank you for giving up your time today. Um, and our panelists, Sarah, Levi and Hazel for taking time out of their busy schedules as students um, and organizing Pride Sock events during LGBT History Month. Um, and then also Cara from LGBT Youth for take, making room for our event on what is already a very busy calendar for LGBT youth. Finally, I want to highlight how valuable it is to have the contribution from people who are sharing their lived experience. Um, and I encourage the audience to be particularly mindful of this when um, they're thinking about the questions they want to ask. So it takes a lot of energy and courage to share the things that you're going to hear this evening, um, particularly with a room, in a room full of strangers. Um, some of the topics discussed may be challenging and sensitive, and we hope that this opportunity this is an opportunity to share experience uh, and expertise and look forward to how we can learn from history to make a better, more inclusive future for everyone. Hi, I'm Jonathan McBride. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Staff Pride Network for LGBT plus colleagues and allies at the University of Edinburgh. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry I can't be there. I hope you enjoy this event as much as I've been looking forward to it. I went to school during Section 28, Clause 2A. I first remember getting called gay and gaylord, whatever that is, in primary school. Uh, I had no idea then what that meant, and it seems like the other kids knew and I didn't, it turns out. 
there was nothing in primary school, nothing in my grammar school uh, as to what gay was. I didn't know a single LGBT plus person. I didn't have any supportive teachers. Uh, it wasn't until uh, just before I was 18 that I heard about uh, someone at school who was gay and I knew them and after quite a while I phoned him up and said uh, are you gay and his response was uh, why and uh, I said uh, because I might be and uh, we talked and so on um, but nobody at my school knew and I didn't know anyone else at school then just last year uh, I went to Dunfermline High School um, during LGBT History Month uh, for uh, Fife Schools Day, uh, it was a Sunday, uh, my co-chair uh, Rosie and I went up and there were teachers there with students, pupils, kids, identifying in every uh, letter uh, and being confident and being able to talk about it, some of them quieter than others, but that was just incredible to imagine that now, to imagine being at school, what it, the difference. Yeah, things are good, things are much better for me now. But I can only imagine how much better it might have been if Section 28, Clause 2A had never been put into action. It was 2001 that I finished high school, at which point Section 28 was still in force in England and Wales, even though Clause 2A had become released in Scotland. Um, when I was at school, I didn't know that people like me existed. Um, I went to a Catholic school gay was an insult and even though there were some LGBT plus people in my family it was never to be talked about. Um, I had stickers of Kylie Minogue in my locker and I remember people saying oh my god you're gay for Kylie and I thought I kind of am but I didn't know what to do with that uh, because I was told that bisexual people didn't exist they needed to pick a side and I was at a Catholic high school, my family was super Catholic, so I picked men and I thought that was my only option and that was me for a very long time. I've only been able to come out for the second time uh, quite recently and to see the number of people my age who had that same experience of thinking that they weren't allowed to be attracted to women and men or anyone in between but they had to pick a side and that they feel like they had to hide half of themselves and that's how I felt I had to hide a lot of myself for a long time and the idea that we can have young people at schools now not have to hide. That's something that I want us to have more of and I want to continue. I finished school in 1993. Um, the, the thing that most people think is that there's no harm from not mentioning about something. That, no, how could that possibly cause children harm to not mention something? But it was very noticeable, the abject terror that came across any staff member when they thought they might have to discuss anything. And it wasn't just being gay, it was the fact that like, they wouldn't, we had one instance where someone brought in a condom and the terror across our tutor's face when he had to try and explain to us 
why we shouldn't possibly touch a condom, but didn't really seem to want to mention anything about any sort of sexual transmission or anything. He, he was just terrified of the whole thing and just treated condoms like there was something hideous that we should never go near. And even though it probably should have been telling us about that. Um, so yeah, it was just the general level that it was just something so horrendous that you couldn't possibly talk about it. And that was very much imparted. So it wasn't like you didn't pick that up. So yeah, that was just, it was very damaging on many levels in the fact that it made you feel that you were definitely wrong and that I was given no sort of sexual education or anything at the height of um, the um, HIV AIDS crisis. And well, slightly coming out the end of that, but I, all the education I received was later when I came from the, um, from the gay community itself. So school very much let me down and a whole generation from that point. So it had serious complications. I think when we think about education, we think if we don't teach something, that that's fine. But actually, by refusing to mention something, by making it a dirty word, by making it shameful, we are teaching children something. By saying, I can't talk about that, and obfuscating and running away from the subject, we're teaching children, this is shameful. This isn't something you can talk to anyone about. Keep it quiet, push it down, there's something wrong with you. And children learn that. So as well as other children learning that it's a thing that can push on people as an insult, as a taunt, people internalise that and think, this is something I shouldn't be, there's something wrong with me. This is why any kind of omission of this kind of teaching, of this kind of knowledge, hurts people. It's not an absence, it's very much a presence, and it's very much a threat. So I went to primary school under Section 28, and while I probably wasn't really conscious of it at the time, it's definitely something I'm aware of now that was lacking in the education that I received when I was in primary school. There was no mention of LGBT identities or relationships um, at all while I was um, a primary school student. When I went to high school in 2001, in theory that should have been um, after the Section 28 had been repealed, but we still didn't have any education in the curriculum about LGBT identities um, or relationships. Um, and it was actually something that was very much actively discouraged within the school population, uh, among the pupils and in the staff. So my school had a habit of celebrating big life events for its staff. So um, there would be things on the school, like computer screensavers saying so-and-so has had a baby, these two people just got married, somebody got engaged. It was always straight couples. Um, and I happened to know through family friends that one of the senior team um, at the school had just got engaged to his male partner um, and they had actually got married while I was still a student there. Um, but this was never celebrated or acknowledged by the school um, and it was a real glaring absence by that point because I had friends who were secretly um, or at least out to their close friends not out at school and it was clearly something that wasn't being represented or talked about um, as part of the school curriculum or just part of the social structure of the school itself. I first heard about Section 28 uh, as soon as it was promulgated uh, in the year it was promulgated, 1988, when I was teaching in a high school, a boys' high school in Australia. And it filled me with horror, um, although I was openly gay at the high school, um, because it was a very difficult time. Uh, there was a lot of, lot of violence going on. There was a murder uh, carried out by schoolboys. Uh, eight boys were imprisoned for 18 years for the murder of Richard Johnson. It was uh, all over the newspapers. And as a result of that, I formed a relationship, uh, a professional relationship, uh, dealing with the issue of anti-LGBT violence in schools with the then Minister of Education, Virginia Chadwick. Um, now, at that time, um, I was Secretary of the Gay and Lesbian Rights Lobby, who were, were very strong activists in the field of education, amongst other things to do with the anti-violence project. And I was uh, met one day by a lesbian high school student by the name of Jennifer Glass, who suggested we form a separate organisation as an offshoot of the lobby uh, and call it the Gay and Lesbian Teachers and Students Association. I immediately discouraged that because of the idea of having uh, students, uh, adults and children in the same organisation ba on the basis of sexual orientation. I said to her, what will you say if someone interviews you on the radio 
and ask you uh, whether teachers are trying to proposition you. And she said, well, I just simply say to them it's not true. And the, uh, the novelty was uh, the candor and the, uh, I suppose the naivety was so breathtakingly convincing, I decided to go ahead and we formed the organisation. And sure enough, uh, the first radio interview she did, uh, the, the broadcaster asked her that question, isn't this an opportunity for teachers to proposition students? And she said, well, that's absolutely not what it is at all. And went on to say how it was a support group and was uh, going to be uh, providing information uh, by way of books and schools, videos, resources, research. And we never had that question asked again. And in the meantime, uh, up until that point, the department's policy had been that the Department of Education does not condone or promote homosexuality. And during Virginia Tedrick's reign, there was an absolute and utter reversal of that to not supporting discrimination. And Virginia Chadwick was the first Minister of Education uh, ever to uh, produce a uh, set of anti-discrimination grievance procedures for students. And that was then recognising that anti-discrimination was against the law. And from there, uh, things just got better and better. And in fact, by the time I left that school, uh, boys were inviting the same-sex partners to the school dance and to the school formal. And my Facebook friends know and the strangest thing was that some of the most homophobic students turned out to be closeted gays and I met them at bars and I said, why did you, why did you do that when you were at school? You were speaking against yourself. They said, well, it was kill or be killed. And uh, so now here I am in Edinburgh on the Staff Pride Network and it's wonderful to have the support of the university and to be able to work openly with colleagues. So I grew up in the 80s and the one thing I can say is that I didn't actually remember Section 28 in a way it didn't affect me directly, I was too young. What I do remember is that nobody ever talked about LGBT issues in the classroom or anywhere else. It's not something you could talk with your friends about, with your parents, with any figures of authority. So being trans in the 1980s when you were a kid is really something that you kept to yourself. Um, didn't tell anybody, it was your dark secret that absolutely nobody should find out about. And I didn't start talking about it until my early 20s, um, which is in the late 90s. So it was a decade where trans people did not exist, except as a tabloid scandal. Um, it was just something shameful. And certainly no teacher would have gone near it. I remember sex ed in high school, <laughs> and there was one lesson which vaguely had had these characters that were kind of androgynous and that was our diversity um, learning on, on sex ed but even that there was nothing about trans and that was like an hour's session within 18 years of, of education almost so really nobody talked about it and you didn't really exist and that's what I remember and I think that was probably part of the impact of section 28. Hello, can everybody hear me? Great. Um, so hi, I'm Elliot. I'm going to be co-chairing um, uh, this panel with uh, Sarah over here. Um, so my pronouns are he, him, and I am the trans non-binary officer uh, for the Students Association here at Edinburgh. <laughs> um, I want to start out, um, first of all, by thanking Katie for doing that wonderful introduction for us um, and you know helping organize this whole thing. So thank you very much, Katie. <laughs> Um, so we've got two sets of questions, um, one on the impact of Section 28 and then one more on uh, uh, treatment of uh, trans kids in schools today. Um, but before I get to that, I figured I'd go down the line and let everybody introduce themselves and talk about how they were impacted um, by Section 28, if they were, and anything else you want to share. Um, so Levi, do you want to start? <laughs> Is that okay? Hi, I'm Levi. My pronouns are he, him. The president of Pride Sock, or like one of them. <laughs> um, yeah, I can hear an echo. Um, was never consciously aware of any effect of Section 28, given that it sort of ended when I was about two years old. But it's very similar to what everyone else in the videos were saying. There was just zero mention of anything. I don't think at any point during sex ed or any sort of social education we mentioned 
queerness as a concept. We did Caroline Duffy's poetry, and that was about it. Yeah, I think I vaguely mentioned her. There's some people who can't hear. It might be easier with this microphone because it's a bit more powerful. I'm finished. <laughs> that was all I had to say. Um, I'm Hazel, I'm, my pronouns are she, her, I'm the trans and non-binary representative for the Pride Society at the university. Um, obviously I went to school after section 28 was repealed, but yes, is that any better? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but I went to a Catholic school, primary and secondary, so sex ed, even straight sex ed was very lacking and in fact non-existent, never mind gay sex ed or queer sex ed. Um, in fact, several of the religious teachers at the school made s several comments on fairly common occasions that gay students would go to hell and the trans students weren't tre much better, let's say. <laughs> but other than that, my experiences are quite few and far between with Section 28. Um, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm the faith rep for Pride Sock. My pronouns are she, her. Um, similar to these two, I've never lived under Section 20 other than when I was like two years old. But um, I think my first experience of kind of feeling excluded in my education was probably I had um, a teacher once tell me it was the Scottish parliamentary elections and I think the party leaders were Nicola Sturgeon, Kezia Dugdale and Ruth Davidson. And Kezia and Ruth had both came out at the same time and he said to me he was going to have to vote for Nicola because he wouldn't let a lesbian run a country. And that was my first experience where I realised Section 28 was pretty much still in force in my school. Um, I also went to a Catholic high school and um, sex ed for me was watching a birth video in first year and getting a talk about why abortion was bad. Um, never got any actual sex education for straight people, never mind LGBT people. Um, and whenever I pushed for it, my teacher told me it was an abnormal idea. Um, so yeah, for me it was very much still in force even though it wasn't. Thank you. Um, uh, my name's Sharon. I'm a professor in the law school here. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm the only person on the panel who's old enough to have lived under Section 28. And I do remember it. And um, my uh, first girlfriend was a teacher at my school. Not while she was a teacher at the school, or while I was a pupil at the school. Um, and she wasn't out to anyone. Um, so I think the impact of Section 28 wasn't just on what you could tell students at school, but also really massive impact on teachers um, in schools who were LGBT. Um, and I think that had a massive impact on people for years to come. She did not come out. Um, in fact, she's not teaching anymore. I don't think she ever came out in her teaching career. So that kind of chilling effect, as, as it might be called, um, had a massive impact on people for a long time, even after Section 28 was repealed, or Section uh, Clause 2A. Um, but I do remember also not having any sex ed at school um, other than sperm and egg in a petri dish drawings and um, nothing about um, LGBT um, education or even out with biology or sex ed classes, we weren't called that actually at the time, um, it was just never mentioned. And the teachers in the school who were either out or weren't out but were suspected to be gay were definitely vilified by students and there was a sense of non-acceptance in the school. So that was a real tangible feeling that I can still touch, if you like. Um, and I would hope that it's different in schools now. I know that not all schools are as keen to teach uh, LGBT education as I'm sure you probably know better than I do. Um, but I think um, uh, from conversations that I had with another um, partner who was a teacher, I don't really date teachers by the way, um, she uh, worked in Portobello High School and I think for that for example is a really great school for, for teaching about um, LGBT stuff. They have um, school groups of um, students uh, that is facilitated by staff and I, I know not all schools do that but I do think it probably is a different environment, a different situation for young people now than it would have been when I was uh, at school. So. Hello, uh, my name is Cara Spence, I work for LGBT Scotland. Um, so I've worked for LGBT Scotland for 15 years. I technically was alive uh, during Section 28, but I don't remember it signif significantly affecting me until I came to work at LGBT Scotland. 
Um, and I remember I'd, I'd been doing youth work in, in schools in Western Hills and in areas and where, where we basically went into schools and did work, work around drugs and alcohol and sexual health. And then I got this job at LGBT Scotland and I was like, why are we not working in schools, guys? This is really important stuff. Um, and so I, I had to get to grips with uh, current social attitudes of that time. So the first school I remember going into, um, and this is four years after Section 28 was repealed, um, I remember that uh, there was a lot of barriers in place in the sense that, um, first of all, we were only allowed to work with six years because it was a sensitive subject. Um, on top of that, um, uh, there was a real nervousness about us even being there. There was a health fair um, where, we're, where lots of organisations were brought in to have stalls. Um, so we were allowed to have a fair in the school, uh, have a stall in this uh, school. Um, and the headmaster caught wind of it. Um, and when the headmaster came out, uh, he, found, he basically frog marched us out of the entire school in front of all the other sector partners um, because he was horrified that we were promoting homosexuality. Uh, talking about sex and of course that was not what we were, we were trying to do at all but that legacy of section 28 was still really clear after four years after the the legislation was repealed and the bit that I think was that was really interesting it was at a parliament event on, on Tuesday is that um, there was a huge campaign to, uh, to keep the clause of, of Section 20. That loads of money went into it. Um, it, was, it was very well funded. And the, the Scottish Parliament took the decision in 2000 to, uh, to repeal that and to be ahead of the game and actually do the right thing. But actually, more than a, more than a million people signed a public petition to keep that bit of legislation. Um, that is unbelievable. It was headed up by the Daily Mail. Um, so that... Uh, is that right? Uh, so headed up by the Daily Mail, and uh, and and so you got to think. So no, so they repealed the legislation, but there was still a, we still had a lot of work to do to win hearts and minds. So it wasn't so that so the the um, the government led the way in repealing this legislation, and that sent a really strong message. But there was still a lot of work to do for us to be able to go into schools and for people to to even listen to us. Um, so yeah, so that took a lot of work. Um, but anyway, so my name's Cara, I describe myself as a, a feminist, proud feminist, proud bisexual, and absolutely a trans ally. <laughs> All right, um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, so our first question is, how important is visibility of LGBT plus staff and students, and what impact did Section 28 have on this? So does anyone want to volunteer to go first? <laughs> So, as I said, I didn't, I obviously wasn't in school around the time of Section 28, but I work in a school in the Northeast during the summer terms. And they are, and don't hold me to this, but I think they are the first school in the Northeast of England, at least, to have an LGBT society. And after speaking to several of the staff there during work, one of them is pansexual and was speaking to me that this was the first school he'd worked at in 20 years that had allowed him to be openly out at school and to openly discuss his sexuality with the students. And being involved with their LGBT network and talking to the kids, it was so apparent to me that they found it so helpful to have staff that they could go to who relate to their experiences and that the staff weren't or didn't have to be scared of talking to the kids about those experiences it makes such a massive difference and I know I would have loved it if I was in school and I had that sort of experience or that sort of model to look up to. Um, I think like in my personal experience I had a lot of di big disagreements with my teachers like encouraging inclusive education and I mean I took it straight to my head teacher uh, did a art national article just totally called them out because I was fed up with it um, <laughs> to put it lightly um, I got pulled up by my head teacher for it like I had tons of disagreements and even my guidance teacher was like oh but Sarah we're inclusive we've never been homophobic and I'm like yeah but you've never mentioned gay people either um, <laughs> And I think if I'd have had someone in the staff team who I knew was like a solid, like knew what I was going through, knew what I was wanting, understood the situation, I think that would have made such a difference to my school experience because I was pushing for things that really weren't that crazy. I was asking for an LGBT group and some inclusive education. Like that's actually a norm in a lot of high schools now. And even now my, school, my old school still doesn't have that. And I left two years ago. Um, and I think having that staff, like a staff member that was opening out, because we had some suspicions, but I never want to assume 
Um, I think if a staff member, like, I can understand why a staff member wouldn't come out with management like that. Um, but I think it would have made a big difference for us campaigning for things if we'd have had that kind of solid link in the staff team. So just after, I, well, sort of when I came out and sort of went to see one of my guidance teachers, he told me that there were quite a few students he knew of who had come out immediately after leaving high school and had never sort of dared to do it whilst they were there. So I was quite impressed that I like, had gone for it all of a sudden. But the year after I left school, so I came out in my sixth year, and I sort of had a gap year, and I got a call one day from the school. And as soon as they didn't mention my sister, I knew, there's another trans kid. They want me to talk to them. And lo and behold, they sort of gave me the mum's number. Like, Please talk to this kid. You're the only other trans person we can think of. And so I sort of met up with them and sort of got along quite well. And this sort of happened once or twice more, where sort of people from my school sent me messages like, hello. And there sort of people sort of years below me who weren't even friends with my sister, had nothing to do with me, but who were sending me messages. It's quite like, Good to be visible. Glad that I did that, even though it was deeply awkward and quite like isolating for me. At least these other kids like got sent someone to sort of talk to afterwards. Would you like to speak a bit louder because some people can't hear? Um, okay, so uh, what do I think? Why is it important? There's some, somebody said in the video <clears throat> the power of not including information. Um, so the power of not saying uh, that LGBT people exist within the classroom is so powerful because what that says is that within society, this is not acceptable. This is not, this is not an acceptable thing to be. Um, so what we know is when there is LGBT inclusion within the curriculum, um, this is really powerful for young people growing up who are thinking about coming out. It sends really positive messages. But it's also about those who have um, two mums and two dads, who have LGBT family members. It's about their siblings um, and feeling that actually I can see my family in the curriculum as well. Um, on top of that, LGBT inclusion is really important for all pupils. So I believe education is it's also, it's, of course, it's about exam results. That's one important thing. But it's also about shaping young people to become adults where they're kind and inclusive of one another and ultimately if we allow young people to grow up in a world where we we don't educate them about the, the difference in the ways in which we celebrate difference in society then that will be difficult for them that means they might have challenges in their career or even worse if they go on to commit violence or violent crimes that will ruin their lives and the lives of others and that's why LGBT inclusion is so important it's, it's both about LGBT young people but it's also about everybody and creating a society that, that we all want to live in. Um, okay, so why is it important for LGBT schools to provide education about LGBT issues? I feel like we covered this one a little bit in the previous one, but does anyone have anything to add or? No, okay, we can move on then. Um, so it's clear from the testimonies that we had um, of the uh, Staff Pride Network members who went to school under Section 28 um, that it contributed to the stigmatization of LGBT plus identities. Has this changed? Any takers? <laughs> yeah. Can everyone hear us? Is that any better? Sorry. <clears throat> Um, I'd say it's changed a bit, but I mean, I went to a Catholic school again, so like it hasn't probably changed as much as it could have. I know there were several, well, I say several, maybe two or three out students in my year group. And even now I can remember that they were the butt of a lot of jokes, especially with the cis straight students. And they, I mean, I have all the respect for them in the world to come out at that age and to deal with all of that, but they shouldn't have had to. And I think like having that representation would have prevented that by making the other students more aware of the issue, I guess, and helping them deal with their own in sort of ingrained biases on the issue. Uh, it's, it is still sort of terrible. It's still very bad. So even from, like, 
I was quite blessed with a relatively chill group of people. I went to a very small school, so we've all known each other since we were about three or four. So it's not, it wasn't very bad for bullying, because it's quite hard to do that when you're all in a small village. But from listening to my sister talk about what her friends had said after I left school and after I'd come out, they're horrible. <laughs> like, those little ratty, horrible children who are saying really just surprisingly backward things about gender for people who are sort of four years younger than me. It's a sort of strange backpedaling, despite the sort of school seeming to get a bit more progressive, a bit more open. The sort of lack of any actual education put in place really takes its toll. And you can really see in the younger years, it's not getting better. People aren't learning anything else. And it's just like, sad to listen to my sister have to talk about it. Um, I don't know, I think it varies from school to school. Um, I definitely think having gone to a Catholic school that the limits and guidelines put on Catholic schools especially, I mean I feel it in Scotland, I don't know how it is in other places, but I know that the guidelines they have mean that they won't, They perhaps are a bit afraid to teach stuff. Um, I know my head teacher's excuse was, but Catholic parents, they're scared, and I'm like, no they're not. Half of them have gay family members. Like, um, but I don't know, like, I know my younger cousin had a really positive experience. Half our friend group, she's in first year in high school, and half our friend group is out. Like, my, my, my grandpa just casually mentioned how she had a girlfriend. I'm like, she's 11 and she has a girlfriend. Oh my, like, it was groundbreaking for me. Because, like, when I was 11, I was, like, bi-curious. Like, that was my, my title for myself. I was just figuring that out, and I was out to about three people as bi-curious. Um... But, yeah, no, I don't know. I think it depends because, like, I know people who are in other schools who have done really well, but it's just it's sad to watch that progress happen while you're just sat there on your Todd with Section 28 pretty much still in place in your school. Um, yeah, I don't know. It depends on the teachers that are in schools as well because some of them still have the same staff that were in when Section 28 was in place and a couple of, you know, a couple of young teachers can really change some of the stuff because they have different training and they have different ideas. Um, which I don't know, I guess the same can't be said for schools that have had the same staff for years and have massive student bodies. Um, so what's changed? So lots changed. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of amazing work that's happening in schools. There's also some people in the room that I know are doing some of this work as well. Um, so at the moment, I can tell you that we are working with 30% of publicly funded secondary schools in Scotland. Um, to do what's called the LGBT Schools Charter. And we make them work hard, I'm not going to lie. Um, so we ask them to ensure that there's inclusion in the curriculum, to review their policies, to consider their training, to really think about their practice for supporting and including LGBT young people. And it's not a tick box exercise, we want to see evidence of impact. So there's some really great work happening. We also know, and we, we had a volunteer phone around schools in Scotland who found out there are now around about 100 LGBT group or allies groups in schools. And I can't, when, I'm, when I was at school, I can't even imagine this happening. Um, so this is just phenomenal and these groups are often sh uh, leading the way in terms of what's happening in schools they're the ones that are uh, driving the work forward and it's, it's just really beautiful to see and they're often so important to support young people who are experiencing a lot of bullying within a school environment um, but, but, and here's the but, so um, lots of great work happening, however if we're working with 30% of secondary schools that means we're not working with 70% of them which is quite a lot. They might be working with other organisations which is also fantastic as well or they might be doing their own thing but we, ultimately we know there are schools out there that are still doing nothing. Um, that's what we know for sure. Um, we also know there's only one denominational school that we are currently working with in the whole of Scotland. Um, so there is still a lot to do there um, and sh to ensure that denominational schools are inclusive and welcoming spaces for LGBT people. Um, I have been uh, pleased though that they have been around, the, 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 the Scottish Catholic Education Service has been around a table thinking about inclusive education, thinking about how can they do it in a way that fits with their teachings and beliefs. Um, so we, we do hope that it certainly will improve. Um, so yeah, there's still a lot to do, but I, I think there is some great work happening. Uh, 
Um, okay, so I think from that video, it's quite clear that trans people or trans children in schools could do with a great deal more support. Um, so I'll start off by asking who should be involved in developing strategies for supporting young trans people in schools? Um, you know, should it be parents? Should it be teachers? Should it be the government? Should it be charity organizations like LGBT Youth Scotland? Um, yeah, if, do you want to start? Um, number one, and who should be involved in developing strategies to support trans young people? Should it be trans young people? Number one on my list always. Um, I, I strongly believe that um, if you are thinking about developing a strategy to support a group of marginalised uh, individuals, you need to put them at the heart of your decision making. Um, that's so important and even today I wouldn't go on the panel unless I knew there was trans people represented on the panel. If we're talking about trans rights, you need to our role is to amplify their voices, not to speak on their behalf, although it feels a bit weird because I'm kind of speaking on their behalf. Um, but, um, so that's most important. And in terms of when, I can tell you what, how we developed our, our guidance in supporting trans young people in school. First of all, we started off with some focus groups with trans young people. We then spoke to parents of trans young people to get their views. We spoke to teachers who had supported trans young people. We, talk, we spoke, spoke to people who had expertise who could write content so they knew about education, they knew about children's rights. Um, so we gathered these people in a room who could write content for us. Um, and then lastly, we, we, got, uh, we, we took it to Education Scotland and, and got some final thoughts on that. So, yeah, we did, we did a lot. We had a lot of thoughts on who should be involved, but number one has to be trans young people. I agree. <laughs> that works. I would be very apprehensive about letting parents or the government or teachers take the lead on any of it because usually they'd be very resistant and sort of putting in little cutting corners to make sure that kids can't do anything. It should just be trans young people, trans adults especially, who have been through education and know exactly what they were lacking and can sort of impart their found wisdom. Um, obviously, I agree with both of you. I think trans young people and trans elders in general should uh, lead the conversations on this, but I think it is also important to realise that without all of those groups working together, it's unlikely that any outreach would reach everyone that it needed to, and that it's important that everyone of those groups works together to achieve the same goal and hopefully progress. I was just—I wanted to sort of follow that up a little bit by saying, like, like that must be very tricky, though, getting all of those groups to work together, um, in the sense that there might be people pulling in different directions, and it's hard to keep everyone working positively together for the same kind of outcome. We only just have to look at what was going on down south around the parents who were demonstrating outside the school because they were doing LGBT education in the school. So obviously there were parents there who weren't happy about that. But in the school's job is to try to um, take everyone with them <laughs> um, and, I, and, and try to change people's minds and try to make a program for education that does involve everyone. And that must be just really, really hard. I can't imagine how hard that must be. Yeah. Um, I mean... I've got, I've got lots of thoughts. Um, so in terms of involving everyone, um, your job is to try and bring them with you. Um, I, I always feel slightly uncomfortable at the thought of like everybody gets to decide the fate of a minority group. Um, sometimes you do need to set up a group of brave individuals who are allies and, and get it, do you know? Um, so, so there's that. Um, in terms of parental rights, I think it's a really interesting one in terms of supporting trans young people in schools. There can be some pushes and pulls about, you know, what's the right thing to do. Um, so, and that can be really difficult for, for schools in order to, to navigate and negotiate what's the right thing to do. Um, we always say that whatever a, a decision a teacher makes, it should be in the best interest of the child. Um, and that's, that, should, that should be the thing that guides their thinking. That's a children's rights approach. Um, however, uh, at the end of the day, in, the, in reality, there's very few decisions are made about children under, so under 16 
uh, that, that don't involve parents. It's, it's very unlikely. That is the reality of, of working in schools right now. Um, so it would have to be something that was particularly se uh, serious to discard the views of parents entirely. And also parents have rights, you know. You don't necessarily want to work against parents. You want to bring them with you. Very interesting uh, perspectives there. Thank you. Um, so, on a more sort of practical basis, what steps can schools take that would make the school environment more inclusive for trans young people? I think earlier some of you were talking about things that would have helped you, like um, having, you know, like someone was talking about having, um, you know, having teachers around who were there. Levi, you talked a lot about um, your experience, sort of, sorry, you talked a lot about your experience sort of being the resource for trans young people at your school. Is there, you know, do you think that there is a way that could have been handled better or like there was someone else who could have been doing that work instead of dragging you into it? I think. The main issue I found with my school was general apathy and a sort of lack of helping. Like, no one really stood in my way when I asked to sort of change names and registers, but no one tried hard. No one sort of really put the effort in to get my name right at any time. And it was sort of very isolating because it was obviously just me who was having this issue in front of a whole class full of people every single day for a year. And it was terrifying and horrible. And when I sort of started an LGBT group in my school, it lived and died with me. No one did anything else with it once I left. I've not heard anything else about it. The teachers should have had some foresight to think, put things in place to keep us going, give people something to go to. Because there were about five or six of us maybe who went to it, some of whom I think were just my straight friends. But people did go. They were years below me. But it just stopped, and it should have continued. I agree with that. Like, well, I just agree with it. But uh, yeah, um, I think it is important that schools start or at least help students organise their own pride societies or LGBT plus societies, just because it gives them, a sp as the video said, it gives them a space to be themselves and to explore their own identities in a way that in a place that doesn't necessarily bring harm to them and but I also think it's important that they bring staff along with them so I uh, like as I said I went to a secondary a Catholic secondary school and though I didn't come out during school I know several people who did come out as trans in the year or two after I left and both left the school after various transphobic or even homophobic comments made by certain staff and just a complete lack of care towards their own needs as trans students and doing something to change that to make those students feel more welcome, it should be a priority. Um, I've done a lot of like local work around um, kind of trying to make sure that schools in my area don't pull the same stunt my school did and um, to put it lightly um, I was meeting with a head teacher a local to me and I was kind of asking him like what are you doing about mental health what are you doing about kind of LGBT education and it was a kind of best practice situation I was like why isn't every school like this um because yeah, I was like well obviously I know that you have an LGBT club I know that you're kind of teaching a lot of really good resources but what are you doing for trans people I was really upfront about it and he's like oh well if they need a changing room we have extra changing rooms that are you know obviously free like they're one person per cubicle like and he's like if they need a the toilet they're free to use the staff ones or we've got like extra ones that are there that you know are there for anyone and every situation I brought up to him he had an answer for and I'm like th like every teacher should have a response to every situation prepared it shouldn't be up to the student to try and have to figure that out for themselves um, and I feel like too often it's kind of put on students to figure out a solution to the problems they're facing when actually it should be put on the staff that are causing those problems in the first place. Um, I'm not sure if I can distill this all into a few minutes. <laughs> um, so, okay, what, what's the best way to uh, include trans young people? Um, okay, so top tips. Ensure they're at the heart of decision making, really think about their needs and best interests. 
um, consider confidentiality really carefully. That doesn't mean if, if they are at risk or someone is at risk themselves, of course you have to share information. There are policies in place in schools which will guide schools within this. But many people in this room will know that being outed, it can be a really traumatizing experience. Um, so unless a, a, a trans person is at risk, we do encourage people not to out them. Teachers can get kind of hypothetical information from colleagues without sharing every personal detail about a trans young person. Um, and of course, if big decisions need to be made, if, if, if uh, names need to be changed on school registers, of course you'll need to involve uh, parents at this kind of point because we have to explain to young people they will get letters sent home so you kind of they are going to have to be involved at some point guys um, what else uh, I do strongly believe that trans young people should be allowed to use the facilities that align with their gender identity it's kind of the whole point of being transgender is to be recognized as your true true gender um, but don't assume that's necessarily what trans people want as well because they might not a lot of trans young people aren't ready for that and don't necessarily want that anyway um, what else? In terms of making inclusive environments, um, don't needlessly gender things that don't need to be. And I don't mean that we should wipe out gender in its entirety. Of course, that exists. Um, but uh, do you know? Do school uniforms need to be so uh, rid ridiculously gendered? And could there be more options? Do you need to line people up as boys and girls? Is that the best way to organise a classroom? Um, having policies that are clear about what staff do, that means that you'll hopefully stop trans people getting bullied by staff because there are occasions when that can happen. Um, have, having visible things on display within your classroom so that um, people feel welcome and included because we know that LGBT young people leave school because they don't necessarily feel like it's a place for them. So it's not just about getting bullied, it's just about saying this place isn't for me, I'm not, I don't recognise myself here. Um, and staff training is key, leadership from senior management, people who are bought in and get it, um, all of that is so important in terms of LGBT inclusion. So one last question very quickly before we go on a break. Um, is there anything that we can learn from this approach in order to, pro to improve trans inclu inclusion at our university? So is there anything that I, as your student association officer, should be doing? <laughs> Call me out, guys. <laughs> I've had some tutors who are very lovely and very helpful in terms of name changes and stuff. Like, the first the first tutor I had when I got to uni was very nice. He was lovely. He's called Pete. Um, he was just very upfront. He was like, this seems to be the wrong information. Do you want me to change this? And he was like, thank you. Great. But that's not across the board at all. And the whole thing where, like, you, know, you go into a tutorial and they've like put up on the board like the class list and you can see your photo and your name and often it's wrong and it's a dick move. <laughs> People would stop doing that. That'd be really nice. Maybe, you know, pronouns as long as the names and the degrees and things. Just like very simple, very easy things to do. They're not that complex or difficult. Just like a bit of thought for people. Um, I had a similar story at you and that just after I came out and changed my name to the university I was outed by my tutor to my tutor group in one of my courses and it, was, it wasn't on purpose, it wasn't malicious or anything like that but it obviously wasn't ideal given that I was still quite anxious in public just about everything in general <laughs> and I wasn't quite ready to be out to the tutor group as it was so I think just making the tutors more aware of LGBT issues could have solved that problem. Um, I suppose if I think about uni similar to, similar to schools, similar messages apply, like what, you know, asking, making sure that all the teaching staff are trained effectively and. Um, that, that's, that the environment's inclusive, do you have posters up when we come, out, come in to st and that you can feel that this is a place for you and um, yeah and, and people making assumptions about your gender, all those kind of things, trying to unpick that a little bit um, and trying to get as many people to, and, and not just for students to be leading the way but as, much, as many staff to get to, on board of, of, with this as possible and understand, that, understand your situation. So. Um, okay, thank you very much for all your responses, guys. Um, so we're going to have a 
10 minute break give or takes, so we'll uh, come back here at quarter past. Um, so have some tea, have some coffee, use the facilities, um, submit questions either electronically with the information on the screen or with the pens and paper provided um, at the front. And there's like a little box there as well. Um, all the questions will be anonymized. Um, I mean, unless you really want to sign your name. Um, so please feel free to, yeah, mingle, have a good time. I'll um, be back here at quarter past. Hello? Can anybody hear me? Great. <laughs> oh, okay. Is this... Can some people at the back hear? Is it too echoey? What's We're the... trying a new microphone. This one's better? Great. Fantastic. I think it's a, I think it's a full volume. Okay. Um, so, a couple things. First of all, we have like 22 questions. We do not have time to answer all of your questions. I'm really sorry. Um, we might look at um, answering some of them at a later date in a like a written format to be posted online, um, but we might not. February is a very busy month. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> um, but um, we've grouped some of them together that are on similar topics, um, and we're going to try and answer those ones first um, because they seem like like multiple people asking similar questions. Seems like it's the best way to do it, basically. Um, also, just a quick one on photographs. The panelists have agreed to be filmed by Staff Pride Network for Staff Pride Network purposes. If you have taken photographs, um, we'd ask that you don't distribute them um, outside of the event, um, and also don't take any more, please. OK, um, great. So let's start with the first question. Um, so this is uh, questions that we've kind of grouped together. Um, what do you think could be done in Catholic schools in particular to help combat hom homophobia? Anyone want to start? Okay. Um, oh, this is such a funky mic. I thought it was a cup when you were holding it, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you started talking into it. I was like, okay. I never have fun lectures like that. It's not fun. You have to be part of the whole lecture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's like a cup, like. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's it's a difficult one. Um, I definitely think just having guidelines like when like for example we had a document when I was in sixth year that was like I don't know it was about love or something it was just telling us like how I live our lives as Catholics and one of the things that was like oh debate is homosexuality a sin and I'm like so like basic things like not encouraging kids to debate homophobia <laughs> um, then also I guess like inclusive um, kind of faith practices would be really good like when you go to mass if you want to have LGBT inclusive mass it's very possible and um, reading out there's a lot of things in any re religion that could be interpreted in an LGBT inclusive way and it probably should be um, but yeah I think the main thing is just changing the way the guidelines are a lot of the documents that are prescribed to Catholic schools by the upper authorities still have things I think there was one of them that said man and women are made for each other and I was like mm, <laughs> are they though <laughs> um, so yeah I don't know I think a lot of it for me is just the way the guidelines are because there's no room for you to start changing things if the way you're being told to teach is you know that exclusive I agree completely with what you said about the debate societies as well. Like we had one in school and I remember being put on the side to argue against gay people being allowed to adopt, which is, that was a frustrating argument, let's put it that way. Um, but yeah, just making sure that staff are aware of LGBT people, whether that's a case of putting staff into some sort of LGBT plus training or even just awareness training. Um, and making sure that their interactions with the students are from that perspective and not from a personal perspective. As I said, I had multiple staff at my school who took a very personal attack against gay and trans students in the school. And that obviously isn't fair and it's not great from any school, to be honest. Um, they should do what all other schools do, I suppose, is the simple question. Um, and without any get-out clauses as well, sometimes that kind of, uh, kind of ends up being in bits of policy and legislation. Um, I have had some really interesting conversations with uh, teachers in Catholic schools and the Catholic Education Service around how it could fit with the teachings of the Catholic faith. And so I think there is some leeway for them to think about how this could, how this could work for them. Um, 
And then there's things that I would advise, them, advise teachers not to say. So we hear stories from young people around people, them being told being LGBT is a sin. That is hurtful. Do you know, so, so ensuring teachers do not say things like that to, to young people is so important. But also just talking, that there's still documents that say that love is between a man and a woman end off. Um, and I think that that also is quite damaging as well. So I'd like to see that change. I was going to say it. Just to add, um, making sure teachers don't use their religion as an excuse um, for any kind of derogatory comments. Um, every ex negative experience I had with a staff member in school was followed by, but you know, that's just because I'm a Catholic, you know, that's just my religious beliefs, so, you know, it's nothing personal and I'm like, right, but you're homophobic. That's kind of personal. Um, so yeah, I guess making sure that while they enforce religion, also not using it as a defence mechanism for, you know, attacking LGBT people of faith. Okay, so um, just using this mic so you can use that one, because I think that you might have something to say about the next question. Um, is there anything that uh, student administrative systems, whether at university or at schools, could be doing to make um, the experience of trans non-binary students better? Yes. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I'm trying to work on right now is the student records at the university. Um, because the way that it works is you have a centralized student record system. Um, and that's pretty good in terms of being able to change um, your preferred first name really easily and your gender marker fairly easily. Um, but then the way that gets filtered out to individual colleges and schools um, and down into individual departments, um, you know, it ends up that that information is quite frequently out of date. Um, and so you get situations where, like, I changed my information on Euclid months ago, and yet here I am sitting in an exam hall staring at my dead name. Like, that's not, that's not a fun way to start an exam. Um, so it's... Uh, you know, and it's, it's fairly simple to rectify that. We just have to, you know, put policy in place that says update your records from the central record um, uh, regularly um, and, you know, at times when students can know when it's happening. Um, so that's one, one thing that can be done. I guess you guys probably have other thoughts? No? Yes? Do you know what people have to provide? Oh, I do. <laughs> um, so... Um, to change your preferred first name, nothing. Um, to change your gender marker, nothing. Um, to change your, sort of, I guess, non-preferred name. So they have like your preferred name and then your like actual name. And to change your actual name, you have to provide a legal document, um, which in uh, Scotland uh, is a deed poll, most likely, um, which is quite easy and free to get. Um, but obviously there are more problems with um, students who are here on tier four visas because it all has to be the same um, as the records that the Home Office has and it's a whole kerfuffle um, and we're working on that. Um, I'm working with Staff Right Network um, and with Wen specifically who's the, the trans officer um, and hopefully looking into a resolution for that. Um, but yeah, you're an undergrad so you don't have to provide nearly as much. Um, you're not a, you're a, a domestic student, so you don't have to find nearly as much. Yes. Yeah. Other than make it simpler, that's, that's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> it needs to be easier um, to, to change the name on, on systems within universities. I'm really loud anyway. Um, but yeah, it should be simpler. Listening to that, is, that's very complicated. Yeah. I got asked for my new and old passport, and not the deed poll. That's... Yeah. That's not correct. But also, it was like three years ago. Perhaps. I <laughs> me as well. When I tried to change my gender marker, I was asked for a GLC, and that was last year. <laughs> they said that they wouldn't be able to change it until I provided a GLC. <laughs> Um, not really about, it's just about names in general. Um, my flatmate um, doesn't use her dad's surname, has never used the surname that she was given by her dad. Um, I think she's legally changed it now to her mum's surname because she's in a relationship with her dad, doesn't like him, generally, that kind of vibe. Um, 
And for about a year and a half, we are just, we are both in second year, and for a year and a half she's been asking the uni, can you please stop using my dad's surname? I don't have a positive relationship with him, and they're still using it. So that's, like, it's still, like, obviously, I guess on, like, base documents, it would be changed, mm -hmm. but, like, and everything that she gets out, it's still got her old name on it, and it means that when she applies to accommodation, when she applies to everything, that same name on her uni documents is getting passed on. Um, it's just a really uncomfortable situation, so, like, I can understand the struggle if that's actually what it's like for you guys, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely not perfect. Um, yes, there are ways to improve. <laughs> Thank you. Um, put my glasses back on. Um, so, Kara, uh, I think this one's primarily for you about the um, the research that you were talking about earlier that formed the basis of the LGBT Youth Scotland guidance and who was involved. Were there universities or academics involved in that, or was it mostly other folks? Um, so. So loud. I don't know if I need this microphone. Okay. Hi. Uh, so, uh, in terms of research, uh, we have a legacy of research at LGBT Scotland where we um, we ask similar questions, we adapt them every five years, and it's a programme called Life in Scotland for LGBT Young People. Um, so, certainly, all the previous iterations have been done by a member of staff that has a doctorate in research. Um, so, because sometimes if you work for a charity, people say, well, it's not real research, it's not done by university, but it was done by somebody who had, had a doctorate had, who, in research. Um, so, uh, and, and also it was supported by university students who worked in placement with us who were studying research. Um, it's certainly not something that I would do because it's not my background. Um, so, and so that it was based on, in terms of need, it was based on our Life in Scotland research. The key findings of our research showed that 71% of LGBT young people and 82% of trans young people experienced bullying in schools, 9% of young people were leaving education and 27% of trans young people left education as a result of homophobia, biphobia and transphobia uh, in the learning environment. So what that said is it wasn't just about bullying, it was also about just not feeling included. Um, it was clear that this was then having a negative impact on young people's attainment as well as their mental health. Um, and 50% of LGBT young people and 63% of trans young people experience suicidal thoughts and behaviours. In terms of the sample, um, and this is where I'm not a statistician, so, so bear with me, um, there were 684 usable responses in the questionnaire, about 33% 33, 33 identified as trans. There were, and then there's like, you have to drill down a little bit deeper, but roughly when I look at who answered that specific question, roughly it looks like about 229 trans young people took part in that research. And then our approach was to make sure that to develop responses, it was consultative. It wasn't just, um, well, we just, we just made it up after that. We worked with trans young people, as I said, and a lot of other people to develop that guidance. And you've got to remember it's guidance. It's not law. This is about guiding people practice and giving them some top tips based on the experience of, the, of, of young people have been through that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll just read the whole thing. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, my school was terrible in acknowledging, never mind educating students about LGBT plus existence or issues. It was never mentioned until at the end of my final year, two incredible NHS nurses arrived and gave a talk about consent, toxic relationships and sex ed. They heavily included LGBT plus representation in their talk. Acknowledging the stress the NHS is already under, to what extent do you believe that the NHS should be involved in LGBT plus education in schools? It should be. It was like one of the sort of, I had a quite good school in terms of sex education. We had it all through sort of end of primary school and then all the way through high school. And we had an NHS nurse called Jan, who was very lovely and friends of my mum, who came in and did proper sex ed with us quite regularly, talked about sort of STIs, lots of different contraceptions, she sort of brought in demonstrations. She was a very helpful person. I think after I started transitioning, she came in and spoke to me. I can't remember what about, but she was very nice and very helpful and sort of offered herself as a sort of resource for me to use. And I think it's very important, especially for young people, when transitioning is such a minefield and so difficult and such a long process. It's important for sort of allies within the NHS to work with young people and let them know what they need to do, how they can get to the places they want to go. Because otherwise it's such a difficult process on your own. 
Um, definitely agree with that. I'd also add, um, I think almost NHS working with teachers could do so much good for LGBT young people. Like, I'm just thinking of the amount of things that my head teacher and my pupil support teacher were so confused about. There was a, there was a trans guy in my year, and I remember just the confusion my teachers had, because obviously you don't get training on the ins and outs of transitioning and everything. That, you know, that's just not something they got given. And I think they found it, that was partially why they found it so difficult to support us, was because they didn't know anything about it. Um, and I almost feel as if actually if the NHS had been able to go, well, actually, this is what young people have access to and this is what they're doing and you can't expect this, this and this of them. And, you know, this is all done at their pace. Like, I don't know. I feel like if they'd have known that and had the kind of insight of people who actually work in this in their everyday lives, then uh, things would have been a lot better. Um. In terms of capacity, I think capacity is an issue for so many services uh, right now, um, including teachers. Teachers often say that the capacity is one of their biggest challenges. Um, so, and, so, and our public services are just absolutely stretched, there's no doubt of that. Um, in terms of what young people want, I don't think they really mind who does it, <laughs> as long as it's somebody who's actually comfortable. Um, the last thing they want is somebody who feels really uncomfortable talking about sex in front of them. It's, it's not a nice experience to go through. <laughs> um, I do think, uh, in my experience working with NHS colleagues, they do often have a, a lot of knowledge to bring because they'll have knowledge of sexual health and relationships um, and in terms of research, in terms of the environment they work in. So I think certainly bringing that expertise is, is useful, at least to what sexual health and relationship education should look like. Um, I certainly think to some extent that the NHS should be involved in at least at the very least setting guidelines for how the sex ed takes place and I know that when you rely on teachers exclusively a lot of misrepresentation of information can be given because it tends to rely on what the, that teacher knows about sex ed so I know after speaking to several cis friends that they'd only and talking about contraception that they'd only been told about the pill exclusively as the only form of contraception that was available to them, and obviously condoms, which are more widely known. And most hadn't really found out about things like the implant until they spoke to doctors later about it. And hearing about that from school, or even the teachers being becoming more aware of it after not knowing themselves is important in making sure that everyone knows as much as they can to make as much of an informed decision as possible. Um, yeah, I just again want to say like I think it's great to have uh, the NHS involved. I had an NHS nurse at my school who did sex ed with us. Um, her name was Nurse Lucy, um, and it was great to have somebody who wasn't a teacher to talk to about those kinds of things. Like I had great relationships with several teachers, um, but I think it would have been really awkward to try and talk to like my history teacher about sex. Like that's you know two things that don't necessarily go together. Um, so it was nice to have a different option. Um, um, the next question is, what can pupils and staff do if schools are pushing back against LGBT inclusivity in schools, uh, even having a group? What can pupils and staff do if schools are pushing back against LGBT inclusivity in schools? Um, go over their heads. It would be my <laughs> first answer. Um, I really struggled with that and our solution was to speak to local councillors, um, people, people who sit on my local authorities education committee, um, the education convener, anyone who is in charge of their jobs to be honest. Um, <laughs> Because at the end of the day, I know my local authority is now looking at implementing the charter mark, um, the LGBT Youth Scotland one, across all schools, regardless of whether or not head teachers want it, which is like really positive for me because they don't get a say. Um, no, they, they, they get a say. Um, but yeah, no, I really do think that just going over their heads and just keep pushing. If you can't get at one point, just find their boss and then go to their boss until you get someone. Speak to the manager. <laughs> Um, before you go over their heads, you mm -hmm. might want to do this first, because <laughs> um, that's like your last resort. Um, so uh, you could look at research, so you've got an evidence base, evidence base is really important to say this is why it's needed in the school. You could consult with other pupils to find out what they're saying, because you're like, because some people go, it's not happening in our school though, and then you can be like, well actually this is an issue here. 
Um, you could talk about your own situation to see if you could draw out a bit of empathy as well, because empathy is quite powerful. Um, also, what's, what, what's quite interesting about a charter at the moment is schools do like a bit of competition. So you can be like, oh, this school next to you has done the charter. That kind of works as well. Um, uh, so those, I'd, I'd do that first before you, before you go over the, their head and complain about them, because they might not speak to you. Do you know? <laughs> I, mean, I did that after I left. <laughs> well done. Okay, so um, this question is about, um, in the 1980s, section 28 would have been mostly about lesbian and gay sexuality and not so much about transgender, because I don't think we were even using LGBT acronyms at that time. And so what is the connection between section 28 and maybe the legacy of that for trans people now? What's, what, what's the connection to having a conversation now about trans young people in school and section 28 from the 1980s? Just off the bat, trans people are also gay sometimes, <laughs> yeah. so that's an issue. Yeah. And it's the same just sort of blankness, like they're not being anything other than being straight. And sort of no one feeling comfortable to sort of discuss any alternates or knowing any alternates just makes everything deeply uncomfortable and deeply unsettling. It's all the same. Yeah. Um, um, so I was going to say, um, you know, I think there is a reason why, um, I mean, obviously previously we weren't using the LGBT acronym, but I think there are a lot of compelling reasons um, why we are now using the LGBT acronym. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, I know that there is a lot of overlap between uh, homophobia and transphobia. And so while, um, you know, trans people in general were more invisible, um, you know, I mean, like we heard Gina say right at the very beginning, you know, trans people didn't exist um, when she was growing up except as a tabloid scandal. Um, you know, the, the same kind of attitudes um, that uh, uh, led to Section 28 being made uh, explicitly against trans, uh, gay people um, are the, the same attitudes um, that uh, lead to the kind of silence on, on trans people as well. Um, you know, it all comes from, from the same source um, and, and from the same wellspring and, and has, uh, you know, a, a very similar, if not identical, impact um, on trans students as it did on gay students and bisexual students. I mean, a lot of the impact is the same as well. Um, I mean, if you look at things like representation in history, um, I think I didn't get any of that when I was, I think I took modern studies and suddenly someone mentioned a trans person in class and I got really excited because that was the first time I'd ever heard of a trans person in school before. Um, and that was with a really solid young teacher who cared about it. Um, but I think like representation's an issue. Sex ed still affects them. Like all of the, all the issues intersect. And I think as well, um, I remember I was at an event one time and someone was talking about the kind of intersections like the second that trans people start getting brought down, you know who's next. It's like, it's all about appearance, it's all about who is going to attack who, like the, all the, the, I guess, anxieties or phobias around it all interlink and all intersect because we've all got the same basis, like you said. Um. The connections. I mean, some, some people could say there isn't a connection because it was about homosexuality, but I think there's, there's an overlap that's quite interesting. Um, one of the things that uh, someone said to me in Parliament was that uh, well, Patrick Harvey had said that he was the legacy of Section 20 as a campaigner, um, which I thought was quite interesting, um, because I'm going to read out the words that Margaret Thatcher said. Uh, Margaret Thatcher said, children who need to be taught the traditional moral values are being taught of an inalienable right to be gay. That will become Margaret Thatcher. I apologize um, of all of those children are being cheated of a sound start in life that's right cheated that's what Margaret Thatcher said at a, um, a Conservative Party conference and what that did is it made people angry it still makes me angry today when I hear it um, but it did create a spark a generation of activists who uh, went on to support and include LGBT young people more broadly and recognizing the overlaps between uh, LGBT identity so um, and on a darker side, I think at the moment there are messages that are really similar out there that, that were around Section 28. The, the message of think about the children, we need to think about the children, is really uh, is becoming really uh, 
uh, common within the media in terms of our work and I find and what young people were talking to me about was that they find that really bizarre because they don't feel that they that think about the children is about saying don't think about you're not allowed to think about us though um, don't think about us at all think about everybody else and often it's not about young people um, so yeah so there's that, that there's there's similar echoes and messages of section 28 that are about trans young people now certainly Okay, um, so wait, let me find it on the computer screen. Um, if there was only one piece of advice or one request you could make of a teacher, if a kid say, said that they thought they might be trans, what would it be? So if there, was, if, there was, if there was one request you could make or one piece of advice that you would give to a teacher in the situation where a student had come to them and said, I think I might be trans, what, what would you say to that teacher? Listen to the kid. <laughs> a combination of having patience and doing your own research and sort of asking the kid what research they would like them to do and sort of what ways the child wants help. Um, to not outright deny the child's experience. I know when I've came out to a few people, their first reaction is to tell me that I'm wrong and that is very damaging to your relationship with the person especially not really ideal mm -hmm. um, I like the point that a young person made in the film and it was um, be kind see me as a human being um, do you know and if, if, if and that's a really simple message for everybody just just to show a little bit of kindness and, and listen So we're really conscious of time and, and we wanted to end on a super positive note. So, <laughs> um, so this question uh, is, what's the best thing a teacher ever did for you or said to you? Um, so my best experience with a teacher in secondary school was actually my history teacher, Dr. Fawkes. Um, and he was this, like, he never explicitly came out to us, but, like, he, he was very kind of flamboyant in a very specific way, and it was kind of obvious. Um, and he's just, like, being there and not, like, he was also one of those teachers who was, like, friends with you, but he wasn't, like, taking any, um, I don't know how not to swear with children in the room for this particular phrase. Um, <laughs> But, you know, like not, not, not taking any shit, basically, from anyone, um, you know, about anything in his classroom and, and you know, very willing to, to banter. Um, and, like, just having him there was really nice as, like, a young kid in a, you know, remarkably conservative school, given the various other facts about it. Um, you know, it was really nice to have someone there. Um, and also he went uh, and he went to dinner at my friend's house once and like brought his husband along and so that was like great. Just having that knowledge and having him be there was, was really fantastic. I had, there was this maths teacher who I didn't have at all really because I stopped doing maths because I'm quite bad at it. But um, apparently she'd gone into a classroom looking for me for someone and hadn't realized that I'd changed my name yet. And one of the people in the class had like had to go at her because she used the wrong name. And we sort of bumped to each other in a corridor or something. And she sort of told me about the incident and sort of very nicely without directly mentioning being trans or anything she's like you're not the only person like there are people before you people after you you're not on your own and they just sort of like went on her way it's like oh thanks Miss Nagel it's like, well, like from a teacher I didn't actually interact with ever I'm gonna keep thinking <laughs> Mine's fairly recent, actually. My PT at uni is amazing, honestly. She's lovely. And when I first came out, uh, a few weeks afterwards, I was the victim of a transphobic attack on campus. And I remember speaking to her directly afterwards, and I was sobbing in her room in her office. And she said, uh, she turned around to me and she said, like, I understand you're upset, but you've got, I, and she said, I'm so proud of you for standing up and it takes a lot to be who you are despite everything and I don't know it just really stuck with me like I don't know it just really stuck with me it made an impression <laughs> 
I'm trying to think of one thing when I was at school, um, but mainly all I can think of at the moment is all, all the amazing work I see from teachers every day. And I think a lot of teachers have to, do, have to really stand up for young people and, and sometimes in schools that aren't particularly supportive. So I think I just want to take a minute just to kind of celebrate all, all the great teachers that are out there that every day have a moment with a young person where they say one line and it will, it will change their lives, really, where they realise that they're able to talk to somebody and, um, and someone is actually nice, for, nice to them for once. So, yeah, I just want to celebrate all those fantastic teachers out there who worked really hard to make it happen. Um, I guess one that's not so much a nice moment, because I had lots of little nice moments with teachers. I can't really single one out. Like, none of them were really related to my identity or anything, but my teachers were pretty nice, the ones that weren't homophobic. But... Um, <laughs> I guess the most kind of impactful one for me was um, it was my head of department for RE actually. Um, she was an absolute. She was. She, I didn't like her when I started school, to say the least. But um, I ended up. I did my higher RMPS with her, and she became one of my favourite teachers. Because um, I remember I was like a right wee like debate type in school. I'd always like challenge teachers. They'd be like, "You are you a homophobe?" Like just be like right at them. Um, and I remember I kind of pulled that stunt with her one time and she was like, and then she actually just went in a full conversation with me about how actually you can be LGBT and have a faith. And it's probably the, one of the only times I've actually been in a faith setting where someone said that to me. And that was a head of department challenging my head teacher almost on, on what faith meant. Um, I don't know, that kind of meant a lot to me because I think if it wasn't for her, I probably would have abandoned religion a long time ago. Just like another sort of brief moment that I wasn't actually there for, but it sort of really benefited my mum and I's relationship was that one of the uh, sort of women who worked in the canteen had, I think, was sort of friends with my mum and had told her that, like, Levi seems to smell more around school. And I think that was a big moment for my mum where she's like, maybe this isn't such a bad development after all. <laughs> my kid's actually smiling at school. Um, thanks very much for that. I'm, I'm going to let you wrap everything up, but I just wanted to say that... Um, we had 27 questions in the end, and I think we just took six there. So I'm really sorry if your question wasn't answered. Um, maybe we could try and put together some written answers for some of the ones, because there were definitely overlaps between certain questions as well. And also, there was someone who wanted some advice about theatre work, and whoever that person was, can you come and speak to me afterwards? OK, thanks. Um, well, I'd like to thank um, all of the panelists for being here today. I'd also like to thank uh, Sarah, for coming. Um, oh, geez, I'm going to see. <coughs> Bless you. Oh, fantastic timing, my nose has. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd like to thank all the panellists. Um, I'd like to thank you for co hosting with me, um, Katie and Robert, and all of the people in the Staff Pride Network um, who helped put it together, and also all of you guys for coming and making this event a success. We have the room for another like five minutes, so if you want to. Um, yeah, five minutes. So if you want to, like, you know, grab another cup of tea, steal some biscuits. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Thanks.